Hello and welcome to today's session. My name is Jane Houston and I'm the Clinical Director of Midwifery and Women's Health at Frontier Nursing University. I'm honoured to introduce my colleague Nina R. Harris, who is an Assistant Professor at Frontier Nursing University and a Family Nurse Practitioner at Shelter Health Services, a free clinic for homeless women and children in Charlotte, North Carolina. Dr. Harris has been a nurse practitioner since 2005 and a CNM since 2006. She received her PhD, MSN in family nursing and BSN at UNC Chapel Hill School of Nursing. She received her nurse midwifery training at Frontier Nursing University. She also has a bachelor's degree in anthropology from Davidson College in Davidson, North Carolina. Her clinical experience as a nurse ranges from infectious disease, labour and delivery, in hospital and in birth centre settings, and working with underserved populations. Today, Dr. Harris spends the majority of her time teaching the women's health and childbearing course at Frontier Nursing University and working clinically with homeless women and children. I'm very happy to welcome Dr. Harris today. Thank you. Hello everyone, it is my pleasure to be presenting during the Nurse Midwives Answering the Call National Midwifery Week. Thank you for joining us. I'm going to be spending my time talking a little about how through limited resources in my practice setting and through some personal epiphanies, my clinical practice has gone back to the basics of healthcare. For many, healthcare is a complicated maze of decisions um, that is based on a power differential of who has the knowledge. Getting back to the basics puts much of that knowledge back into the hands of the patient so that there is less dependence on the healthcare system and utilization is balanced with more preventative care and less illness care. So my clinical practice is at a free clinic for homeless women and children. We work from a limited budget, so we often have to get creative when providing care for an ever-growing census of women and children at the shelter. All care and medications and lab work is free of charge. So as you can imagine, these costs add up very quickly. We must be diligent to only include what is really needed in the plan of care for a patient. And without insurance, there are often roadblocks to getting them care in the community. So I often find myself incorporating some basic healthcare principles that do not involve a prescription or a full workup, um, a full diagnostic workup. Um, several years ago, I went through some health problems of my own and found myself going from appointment to appointment only to find out in the, in the end, there was nothing that seemed abnormal. So after about $2,000 towards my deductible and no answers, I was frustrated, but also motivated to find out what I could do to help myself to feel normal again. This opened my eyes to the power of some of the things that I will talk about in my presentation. Lastly, my clinical practice and my own personal health journey really got me on the road to pondering about what we can do about the rising healthcare costs in America. I've seen many examples of overutilization and overintervention in my practice. Women may go to the health um, department, for example, seeking care that I felt was not needed after they've seen me. On the other side, women report having been in the emergency room with one seemingly basic complaint only to have a discharge summary with a full diagnostic workup fit for a queen. On both sides, we have um, too much work or a lot of work to do to reduce the cost of health care. Women may also come back from a provider in the community with a prescription for a very expensive medication without any insurance. And there was never a discussion about how they could go about paying for that prescription. So the root cause for all of these issues is low accountability on both sides. There is not much disincentive for things that stress our healthcare system. So before I go on, let's talk a little bit about homelessness. Um, homeless women are typically facing many overlapping issues that have resulted in their homelessness. Of course, the ultimate cause of this is poverty. Regardless of the other issues a woman faces, if she does not have the finances to maintain housing, she will face homelessness. Many of these women have challenges with substance abuse, 
Some have chosen homelessness over staying in an abusive relationship. More and more women are presenting to our clinic with significant histories of mental illness, oftentimes with more than one diagnosis. These are the majority of reasons for homelessness, but there are a few who are simply facing a temporary crisis. Some recent examples are losing a home to a fire. We had a woman recently here from Florida, a place with us by FEMA after Hurricane Irma. And we have even had um, a woman in her 80s who left her grandson's home because she no longer wanted to help take care of her great grandkids. So our population is mostly African-American women of childbearing age. Many have experienced childhood and or adulthood trauma and all of them are in transition. So many of these women will feel the need to explain how they ended up in the shelter and what their plans are for getting back on their feet. And I have found that this is a very important part of their emotional well-being that we assess during the visit. We often like, a, like to have an, an intellectual discussion about cultural competency. I really like to just approach this issue as the need to know my population and community. It does not require us to come in knowing everything about who we encounter, but it does require a willingness to learn and the respect for what the patient brings to the table. So getting to know your community means knowing um, the patient's history, their present circumstances, future goals and setbacks. As I stated on the last slide, women often feel compelled to share their struggles as well as their goals. Women who have struggled with substance abuse, for example, will talk about how many days they have been clean and express excitement and hopefulness about what the future holds as they work towards maintaining their sobriety. I have to get to know women's fears, their motivations, and assess barriers to care as I contemplate how to best care, uh, care for them and work with them. Only after I assess each of these can I truly focus on their health care needs. As an example of a provider who knew and had the trust of her community, I wanted to present a video about Mark Callen, a nurse midwife from rural Pineville, South Carolina, who served that community from the 1920s to the 1980s. As you watch the video, consider the tangible and intangible ways in which she provides basic quality health care. The South Carolina Hall of Fame was founded in Myrtle Beach in 1973 to recognize and honor contemporary and past citizens who have made outstanding contributions to South Carolina's heritage, history, and progress. In the early 1920s, for many South Carolinians, living in Pineville and the surrounding countryside, finding adequate health care was a challenge due to its virtual non-existence. One courageous woman would single-handedly answer that challenge, becoming their angel in twilight, changing health care in Berkeley County forever. Maud Evelyn Callan was born in 1898 in Tallahassee, Florida. One of 13 sisters, she was orphaned at the age of six, and raised in the home of her uncle, Dr. William Gunn, Tallahassee's first black physician. She studied nursing at Florida A&M University and Tuskegee Institute in Alabama. In 1923, she was called to Pineville, South Carolina as a medical missionary, creating makeshift clinics wherever she could. Maud Callan was one of only nine nurse midwives in South Carolina at the time. Ms. Callan was very in instrumental in bringing health care to this area. For some people, she was their doctor. Very important to the whole community. She was everybody's friend, helping everybody, giving you a free shot, what you couldn't pay for. She was more than just a nurse. She was a doctor too, because you didn't have to go to the doctor after you left her. She was not only a nurse, she was a doctor. A lot of people that couldn't go to the doctor in San Speedman. Ms. Maude Kellen was our doctor. 
In 1936, Maud Callan joined the Berkeley County Health Department as a public health nurse, providing vaccinations and examinations, keeping records on children's eyes and teeth, and training midwives. I've always said that she is the Mother Teresa of, of, of Berkeley County because she gave so much. She trained a whole lot of midwives that, that help others. Her legacy will pass on. I am a product of one of her midwives. And me and my brothers and ancestors are a product of Ms. Mark Kellen, midwife. I do remember my grandmother just telling me um, the night in which my mother went into delivery, it was like, I guess, a little chaos there, but uh, my grandfather went, I don't remember if it was horse and buggy or with a truck, and picked up one of the um, local midwives that she had trained. In 1951, Life Magazine published a 12-page photo essay by prize-winning photographer Eugene Smith. This article generated thousands of dollars in contributions. Nurse Callan would use this money to support a modern health clinic next to her church in Pineville. The article in this magazine really took her out of Pineville. Um, Smith was an award-winning uh, photographer, and he captured the essence. When I look at these pictures, I see he just captures the essence of the area. Of, of, of the personality of, of Maud Callan. This is a classic shot here of delivery of a baby. And this is at 5.30 a.m. You know, with, with the way Smith does this with the series of delivery, the, the, the pain of childbirth, the baby born, um, the mother comforting the, the daughter, and finally the baby arrives, and then Maud looking out, holding a, looks, what looks like a Coke, uh, and resting a while after more than 27 hours. These two pages tell a story about a childbirth. You know, here she has her bag, and she has her lantern. She used to carry that lantern around with her, because in many places, sometimes, when she arrived, she had to have light because they had to go and find a lamp and light the lamp. And what's interesting is that shot where she's walking over a branch where the water is high after rain and you had to walk from one puddle, one a high piece of dirt to another, then to a log and then to something else before you got over it. Uh, that was always the problem. And I noticed she had that old Chevrolet or something that she drove. And I can imagine that many times she got in bogs because I've seen so many of those cars in the, <laughs> and they'd have to put hay and stuff under them to get them and rock them out. Uh, so it was real an ordeal that she, um, she handled so well. This was the first baby she delivered. And he now is 86 years old, my brother-in-law. When I was born, I was a sick little baby, a little baby. But the people, some people say I ain't gonna live. But most of my baby could die, I said, yeah, you ain't going to do good because you swore a little, but I live. I surprised them because I didn't die, I live. And I live from then up to now. And Maude Keller was my doctor. Today at Claflin University in Orangeburg, South Carolina, Maude Callan's niece, Juliet Dean Satterwhite, is a registered nurse at the Student Health Center. She recalls helping her aunt Maude at the tender age of five. I can remember a time, even at that young age, her husband was sick, Richard Callan. We affectionately called him Uncle Dick. And she would allow me to give him medicine, his heart medication. I would have to check his pulse at that young age. She taught me how to do it. With this being her alarm clock, I would watch for 60 seconds, count his pulse. And if it was 60, or greater, then I could give him the tablet. And that's exactly what I would do. And she would say, great job. One day you're gonna be a good nurse. And I was like, a good nurse? She told me that so many times I actually believed it <laughs> and followed in her foot tracks. Maud Callan retired from her clinic in 1971, 
but continue to serve the community as manager of the Senior Citizen Nutrition Council in Pineville. She delivered meals on wheels five days a week, as shown here in the 1983 CBS News segment On the Road with Charles Corral. She says she works part-time. Part-time to Maud Callan is from early in the morning until the middle of the afternoon. Miss Carrie, I want you to get your other plate there. I've seen people in need so much, and there's so much to be done. I decided within myself that I was going to make some effort in order to help them to live a better life. I can see, I can see in spirituality and the Christian way of life that Maud Callan passed more than just medical help to this area. I have a wonderful congregation of Christian loving people. And I think Maud Callan, I know Maud Callan had a lot to do with that. I visited when she did the nutrition center and she was wonderful with those elderly people. She was just phenomenal. Well, I always remember her for her kindness. You know, in my neighborhood, she did a lot of things for people. And she always said to me, don't give to the people that have, always give to the needy. She really stepped up to the plate. She had that compassion to deal with people and she saw the need and she didn't let nothing turn her back. Nothing stopped her. Maud Callan died in 1990. It is estimated she delivered between six and 800 babies, trained some 400 midwives, and brought health care to thousands. To them, Nurse Maud Callan was their angel in twilight. She loved people. She would do anything for you. And she was just Maud Callan. <laughs> As you can see, Ms. Callan was well trusted by her community, and that is because she got to know her patients as individuals. In our times, it is more difficult to live alongside our patients and get to know them as intimately as Ms. Callan. In our clinic, we, we do try to regularly find ways for us to engage with women outside of the clinic walls. I am not there every day, but our staff members who are will often go into the shelter and participate in various activities with the women, such as the Zumba classes that we offer there. So these are just examples of ways that, regardless of where you live and where your patients live, you can um, become engaged in their everyday lives. So keep in mind some of the things that you observed in the care provided by Ms. Callan, and let's talk about the basics that are often forgotten about in healthcare today. These are all things that I'm trying to emphasize more and more in my practice. Women in the shelter come in usually with health conditions that are already out of control. At the very least, they are at a very stress stressful time in their lives and they're usually not paying the best attention to these basic things. Of course, poverty impacts their access to proper food and nutrition and stress levels are inherently high because of their current circumstances at the shelter. So exploring ways that they can maximize these things and it um, is a very important, important part of our visits. Sleeping in a dorm full of other women and children compromises their attempts for adequate sleep. So we do things like giving out earplugs, um, sometimes melatonin to try to help with, with that issue. If a woman is really having trouble, um, she's usually open, open to using some Benadryl, at least temporarily, to help her get more sleep at night. Keeping the immune system is very important. Um, keeping it strong is very important, especially in a shelter setting. Um, and it's very essential that we try to do as much as we can to prevent acute infections, as well as worsening of chronic conditions. We know that women are also often the caretakers of their families. Um, a lot of our women do have children in the shelter. 
And so the benefits of helping them to achieve their optimal health spreads to their entire family. Now at our shelter, women do not have much control over what they are fed while they're there. So it is fair to say that any education about nutrition will fall into the category of anticipatory education. My only goal is to plant seeds that will hopefully take root once they are out of the shelter and back on their feet in their own place. Most women are really motivated at this time to improve their lives and take in their time in the shelter is a great time for planting these seeds as women are looking forward to a fresh new start um, when their time at the shelter is, is done. We know that diets that are plant-based and free of hormones, preservatives, and additives are going to help improve many chronic conditions. These are not diets that are free from any particular um, thing or ingredient, but rather we do talk about how to increase those things that are good and reducing things that are not so good in the women's diet. So it gives them a little bit of freedom and um, frees them from that um, legalistic um, idea of, of what women should and should not eat. Also women um, do not know that there are a variety of spices and herbs that can help with everyday symptoms. For example, oregano has antibacterial properties uh, turmeric has anti-inflammatory properties and ginger has antiviral and anti-inflammatory properties. So a nice cup of tea from boiled ginger, a little bit of honey and some lemon can be a great drink in the early stages of an upper respiratory infection. I've also recommended a variety of herbal teas for things like upset stomachs, uh, menstrual cramping, and having something that is more natural to help um, with some minor health problems. And women really feel empowered knowing that they can go to the grocery store and pick up some things that um, that will help them. And they feel more um, confident using things that are more natural. We are in Charlotte, North Carolina. So we do have a lot of women who are um, from the rural areas of North Carolina and they really appreciate that approach. There's you know, oils in the kitchen that can be used, especially as moisturizers or soothing minor skin issues, um, including olive oil and coconut oil. Both of these have a um, wide range of health issues and health and beauty uses. So along with plant-based diets, I encourage re reduced processed foods and promoting um, whole foods by finding ways for women to um, supplement the food that they get from the shelter with some options from the grocery store that they can get usually with their food stamps. So women, while they're getting the bulk of their food supplied by the shelter, can actually use this as a, a chance to try some other, um, incorporating some other things into their diet that they're not used to, to eating, namely more fruits and vegetables and more whole foods. And so, um, so women would choose to often buy more fruits and vegetables during this time to supplement what they're getting in the shelter, which unfortunately those meals are a lot of times very carb heavy. Something else that we really try to do is um, we started to give out more supplements when we have them available. So we are, some that we, we will purchase um, out of our budget and a lot of times we get donations. So we typically give out more vitamin D than, than anything as well as probiotics than the others. Uh, many women are low on vitamin D, as um, well known. And so this is one that most women can benefit from and Probiotics are often part of my plan of care for women who come in with vaginal complaints. Sometimes there is just a mild imbalance and women appreciate knowing that they can get probiotics over the counter and not have to take a prescription medication. Um, once they leave the shelter and do not have insurance, they will need to be able to treat these minor issues on their own. Um, and this is often welcomed information. Magnesium can help with sleep as well as uh, constipation. Uh, mood, mild mood issues, and mild headaches. So this is another supplement that we sometimes recommend and give out for women. When thinking about detox, women are often thinking about their own substance abuse when they come into the shelter. However, I often explain that their bodies are going through a process of cleansing as they recover from their substance abuse women will begin to notice things that they did not notice while using drugs or alcohol. And so they're more aware. And so helping them to support their bodies through that, through those residual detox effects, um, that process is very important. Increasing their water intake um, is essential to flushing out these impurities in the body. 
after that, supporting the body with good nutrition, decreased sugar, um, increased fruits and vegetables, as I've already, already mentioned, is, is very important as well. Women cannot um, are not going to be juicing and blending um, to make juices and, and smoothies at the shelter. But this is something that they can incorporate when they are in their own home. And so a lot of women do set that as a goal when they're um, planning to leave the shelter. One of our constant battles in the shelter is helping women to manage the environment in the shelter. We get women who have not had allergy or asthma issues in a long time come to the shelter and begin having significant symptoms because of the environment. Women want to keep the areas clean, so they are spraying disinfectant at every turn. Women want to smell good, so they put on perfume. So a dorm full of, a dorm full of 50 plus women all putting on perfume and spraying their areas is enough to make anyone develop shortness of breath. So those with pre-existing problems um, really do suffer in the shelter. So there are cleaning products that are used heavily in the shelter as well as they are trying to clean common areas. So we try to advocate for, um, for, to, for some of these triggers to be minimized, but it is a never ending battle because again, women make their own choices and there aren't any formal uh, policies in the shelter um, against using some of these. So again, we plant seeds and we and we have a captive audience as women are experiencing some of the um, side effects of of these harsh um, toxins in the air, they can um, have a goal to to improve that when they return to their own space. A woman coming in with a rash from a new soap um, that she started using at the shelter because she she has lacked her own personal hygiene products is a great time to talk about what the skin absorbs and reacts to. We also, in, in recognition of, um, of women being exposed to different soaps and different laundry detergents and things, we'll often have supplies of, of unscented mild soaps in the clinic that we can give to women. So we really do try to meet their needs um, as you know in, in their situation that they're in. So women who are reacting to triggers in the shelter are usually open to hearing about um, making cleaning products with natural uh, ingredients like vinegar, lemon juice, and baking soda. And these are things that they can make easily and are usually going to be less expensive than, than buying some of the cleaners on the market. So when they return to their own home, um, again, we're planting seeds for detoxing that environment. And this is especially important, important for women um, or women with kids that have respiratory issues. So the, the use of technology is not a significant issue in our clinic. We have a very basic um, electronic medical system. Um, I still do a old fashioned soap note from start to finish. So um, like Mart Callen, we are often working with the bare necessities. We have basic equipment, but we do not have a lot of the diagnostic equipment that other providers can really use, can readily use. However, we find that we often do not need it. So if a woman needs um, imaging of some sort, I can usually get her a visit in a community clinic with more capability. Um, however, these appointments can sometimes be weeks away depending on the issue and the woman's insurance status. As a result, I have learned to solve many problems without the use of technology by making, by asking these questions. So since, insur um, since it does take a long time to get another appointment, in the community with um, at a clinic with more capability, especially without insurance. Um, I have to know the value of the diagnostics that I am recommending. We do have free lab work, um, so that is very valuable. So we can often get the, the labs that we need. Um, so I have to think of other ways usually to treat something, um, at least in the meantime, that I can usually, um, and I can usually find an effective treatment and so there's close follow up to make sure that what we're recommending is, is effective. Sometimes um, women have vague symptoms that, you know, we do labs and they, they come back normal. Um, and if it's not truly urgent, we, we do try to avoid sending them to the emergency department. But um, we do have a few select options for sending women and trying to expedite that process. But it is a continuous um, battle. So if we were to go back to the days of Mott Callen, would we be able to treat patients with effective plans of care? 
or would we be lost without our technology? So I would like to think that we are turning the corner and returning back to the basics of those things that will strengthen our bodies enough to fight against disease before it sets in and witness the transformation of our healthcare delivery into one that is focused on wellness and prevention. So this is the end of my presentation. I do thank you for joining me for National Midwifery Week. Thank you.